As we said last time, uh, these oracles against the nations uh, divide uh, with 97 verses given over to Egypt and 90, according to my count, 99. Now, Daniel Block says it's 97 for both, but uh, he must be counting differently than I. And it may be, I didn't look at the Hebrew, it may be that in the Hebrew they combine some verses or something. But so in this first section, we have, as we saw last time, the, um, a series of short oracles against, um, if you look at chapter 25, against uh, Ammon. And as we said, basically moving um, clockwise then Moab, then Edom, then Philistia, then Tyre. And if you look over at the end of chapter 28, the one I want, yes, 28 verse 20. You see again a short oracle against Sidon, farther north up the coast, about 15 miles or so north of Tyre. And then finally, in verses 24 through 26 of chapter 28, a promise to Israel. Now, each one of these closes with the line, then they will know. So, if you look at going back to uh, chapter 25, verse 7. I will destroy you and you will know I am the Lord. Uh, verse 11, Moab, they will know I am the Lord. Verse uh, 14, they will know my vengeance, declares the Lord. Verse 17, Philistia, they will know I am the Lord. And if you look at 26, verse 6, Tyre, they will know I am the Lord. So there's a sense in which what we're looking at in 26.7 through the end of chapter 28, well, not 28, but uh, not the end, but 28.19, is sort of a parenthesis in this series. Notice that the same thing is true with Sidon, verse 23 of chapter 28. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So all of that argues that we've just got this rather long parenthesis that we're, uh, we began to look at last week with 26.7. And we're continuing tonight with 27 and 28. Here we have a series of oracles. The first one is addressed, excuse me, 27, yes. So, addressed to Tyre, the city. So that carries us through that entire chapter, 27. Then, chapter 28, 1, addressed to whom? The ruler of Tyre, the king of Tyre, yes. 
And again in 11 to 19, take up a lament concerning whom? The king of Tyre, 28.11. And then in 28.20, it's Sidon. And in 28.24, it's Israel. So that's, that's the layout that we have here. So we have an address to Tyre, the city. Whoops, not that way. Mm-hmm. Yes, and then two of them to the king of Tyre. And we'll uh, want to see how that develops. In that translation, that in the first uh, verse, uh, the second verse of 28, it said prince. I was wondering if there was a difference there, or is it both to the king? I wondered if it was to the king's son. Well, yeah, it's, it's really... Um, just a different Hebrew word. It's, it's uh, the word for king is melech, and the word for prince, which is not as we think of the son of the king, it's really a synonym. So that's what's going on. Uh, that, just for fun, is the word sar, and, and it can be used uh, interchangeably with king. It can also be used for second rank officers as well. So it's, it's a little bit uh, flexible in its use. Okay. Notice the repeated phrase in 27.3. What does Tyre say of itself? Perfect in beauty. Yes. And then over in 28.12. Now the Lord is talking about them. You are the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. There it is again. Uh, and it is a word that is uh, pretty much unique to Ezekiel, this, the word that's translated perfect. Uh, but it has the idea of totality in every way, in every part. So here it is. Not only does Tyre say of themselves, we're perfect in beauty, but God says of the king of Tyre, you're perfect in beauty. So we wonder there uh, just exactly what the point is that's being made. What do you think? John? Maybe he's really bringing to light their own self, their own absolute dependence on themselves to do everything for themselves. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. In many ways, uh, this is the perfect phrase for pride. And it's interesting that God says, you have reason. Again, we're going to look a little more fully at that later, but it is, they say it of themselves, and God says it of the king. So, yeah, Tyre, you really have reason to be proud. You really have reason to uh, congratulate yourself. But the problem is, Yes. I thought it was also interesting 
that he reminded them that you enhanced, you perfected your beauty, and he lists all the things that he had created, the trees, the bricks. Yes, the yes, he yes. Him that he did create beauty, but they are enhanced by what he made, not they made. Yes, there's, there's the issue. Uh, somebody said, well, it's not really pride if you really are better than anybody else. <laughs> also, you're not paranoid if they really are out to get you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so there's this sense in which all through here, God is saying, yeah, yeah. From a human perspective, you have reason to congratulate yourselves. You have reason to think, I am more perfect in beauty than any other city in the world. But <laughs> you are a creature. And when you take your perfection and make yourself equal to God, that's, that's when you've gone over the edge. And it's, it's ultimately, it's ultimately the issue with humanity. We do not want to accept second place. I had a friend that was at the great beautiful home and she was telling me how mad that God was really happy. He said, I'll have you know, I work to make God happy with that. And that is the attitude of all of humans. They get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I achieved this. And so the whole issue of do we, in fact, cultivate an attitude of gratitude for the blessings that have come to us, or do we, in fact, praise ourselves? I have done these things. I am this way. Uh, here it is. So that this becomes, it seems to me, more and more central in our lives, uh, particularly as we get older, to cultivate that continual Attitude of gratitude, continually recognizing whatever I have, whatever I've achieved, whatever I am, it is ultimately a gift. And I thank God for it. Now, in verses 3 through 9, you have this picture of Tyre as what? Chapter 27, oh. verses 3 through 9. Okay. Yes, yes. A beautiful ship. Uh, is that appropriate? Yes, yes. Tyre was a seaport it basically, as we said a bit last time, it looked to the west. Uh, geography is so, so significant in uh, thinking about what happens and who we are. So the, the Lebanon mountains are here, and the anti-Lebanon mountains are here, and between it is the valley. <laughs> the Arabic word is Beka, and that means valley. 
these mountains are steep. And so the coastline of Lebanon is sawtoothed like that. Travel to the east is difficult. Damascus is over here, and Damascus throughout its whole history has lusted to control Lebanon. <laughs> and Lebanon has, by and large, always maintained its independence from Syria because of geography. So, these cities, Tyre here, Sidon up here, they do not tend to look eastward, but they look westward. And, as you probably remember, Carthage, that almost <laughs> equaled Rome, was a colony of Phoenicia. All the way over on the other side of the Mediterranean. And in fact, the Phoenicians then did, not simply Carthage, but they had many other colonies, especially on the African side. The uh, Romans were working on the northern side, but there it is. It's also, uh, some people contest it, but it seems that it's a fact. In 600 B.C., So here we're talking about the 580s. In 600 BC, the Pharaoh commissioned a Phoenician fleet to circumnavigate Africa. So again, these people are sailors. <laughs> they are competent sailors. And so the picture here is uh, entirely appropriate. Your domain was on the high seas. Your builders brought your beauty to perfection and so forth. So the, uh, the wood that's used, the uh, linen that was their sails, their awnings, their oarsmen, everyone. Then it's interesting in verse 10, he shifts his uh, metaphor a little bit and goes back to the city. From Persia on the east to Lydia on the north and Put, which is in the south. So all of these guys, Arvad and Helek are to the west. So all the world North, south, east, and west is drawn to you. Then, in verses 19, excuse me, 12 through 24, we have the list of their business partners. And if you uh, did look, this again pretty well covers the world. I've drawn worse maps. <laughs> so here's Tyre. Almost certainly Tarshish was on the coast of Spain. So that's where we start. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of goods 
they exchange silver, iron, tin, and lead for your merchandise. And uh, that was there in Spain a uh, source of smelting for all of this. So from one end of the Mediterranean to the other. Greece, Tubal and Meshech, probably, probably these are the Balkans. Exchange slaves and articles of bronze for your wares. Beth Togarma was located also, probably, uh, more questions here, probably in what is today northern Turkey. The man of Rhodes, southern Turkey, Aram, Syria. Judah and Israel, Damascus in particular, the Danites and the Greeks from Uzal, Dedan is also probably over here, Arabia and the princes of Kedar, Sheba and Rama, Haran, Kana, and Eden, and merchants of Sheba, Ashur, and Kilmad, and that's it. Notice. No mention of Egypt. And in fact, there was considerable trade between Egypt and Tyre with Egyptian wheat and then finished goods from all over the world coming back to Egypt. So uh, why he doesn't cover Egypt at this point is an interesting but finally unanswerable question. Uh, it may be because he's going to give 97 verses to Egypt here shortly. <laughs> but there it is, all over the world. All kinds of trade. And again, clearly, Tyre is the middleman. Getting materials from one part of the world, transshipping them to other parts of the world, and uh, so forth. Then we go back to the ship imagery. Now all of these goods that we've just talked about are on board. You're filled with heavy cargo in the heart of the sea, verse 25. Your oarsmen take you out onto the high seas, but an east wind will break you to pieces in the heart of the sea. Your wealth, merchandise and wares, your mariners, seamen and shipwrights, your merchants and all your soldiers, everyone else on board will sink into the heart of the sea on the day of your shipwreck. The suddenness here is, I think, significant. Verse 26. Verse 25 B, you're filled with heavy cargo in the heart of the sea. Your oarsmen take you out to the high seas, but the east wind will break you to pieces in the heart of the sea. What does that say to us about our lives and the attitude that we ought to be developing? Be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. Okay. Number one. What else? Don't say that Psalm 73 says, Truly God has set them in secret places. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes. Okay, okay. So they're going across the sea to the Pelican Inn in time, and yet on their way to implement all the gifts of the Buddha that they're there. Your flourishing could be the root of destruction. What else? Yes. What are you trusting in? What else? Okay. Okay. Pride comes before a fall. All we have is a gift from God. If our possessions and accomplishments begin to displace God, watch out. Everything we have, except God, could be taken away from us in a minute. If we get our priorities misplaced, we're in terrible danger. We can't lose him. <laughs> we can lose everything else. But if we have him, then we have everything worth having. I think all of us have had those experiences where a second has changed everything. We've been going along, everything's fine, everything's fine. A phone call, a telegram, front wheel drops off the berm. <laughs> so what is it that you really have to have? Who is it that you really have to have? And therefore, this ought to mean that whatever we have, we hold very lightly. I, we've talked about it before. Augustine's line, idolatry is the worship of what should be used and the <coughs> use of what should be worshipped. So... There it is. There it is.
I think it is um, Bonhoeffer who said, I can really own something if in my heart of hearts I feel I would be better off without it. If I have to have this, I'm in trouble. So it is here in this long, beautiful poem, the wailing, the mourning, as they, all your business partners, find out it's over. Verse 33, when your merchandise went out on the seas, you satisfied many nations. With your great wealth and your wares, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are shattered by the sea in the depths of the waters. Your wares and all your company have gone down with you. All who live in the coastlands are appalled at you. Their kings shudder with horror. Their faces are distorted with fear. The merchants among the nations hiss at you. <laughs> they were your friends. Now what? You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Now, look back at verse 21 of chapter 26. It's almost the same. What's the difference? I will bring you. And we're going to see it yet a third time in 2819 at the very end of the treatment of Tyre. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You will come to a horrible end and will be no more. Well, as I've said many, many times, when you see repetition, you should ask, what's the point? <laughs> Why say that three times? Not too big to fail. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And God sends final judgment. They can't keep that. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes. Yes. This is the... just for the fun of it. Isn't that interesting? That's not the final word. This is the final word. So, once again, the question is, <laughs> upon whom am I depending? Am I depending on myself, and my achievements, my perfections? A horrible end. But if I'm depending on God, ah, that's a different story. So we come now to the king of Tyre. We've been talking about Tyre and all her achievements, all her wealth, all her world connections. Now it's the king. 
And in some ways, I think the, the uh, you know, Ben has said it here, the, the inductive Bible principle is called particularization where we've moved from the nation as a whole to the guy who's at the heart of the nation. Why these issues? Why these problems? Why these successes? Here they are. It's laid out right in the very first line. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God. Oops, <laughs> oops. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a man and not a God. Though you think you're as wise as a God. Now, let's talk about that. How do we humans think that we are as wise as God. Secular humanism, yes. Pardon? Okay. We think we know how to run our own lives. What else? How, do, how does humanity, particular modern 21st century humanity, think that we are as wise as God? We think we can explain creation. We don't need God. We got it figured out. What else? <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Proof is subject to our rationality. If it can't be explained in a way that suits my logic, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. We ignore God-given limits. Yes, if we can create a baby in a test tube, we should do it. All right, all right, all right. <coughs> Truth is subject to our interpretation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the interpretation is what's true. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Put etc. That's not the only thing we think we can choose. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are not creatures. We are God. We can also choose life or death to make that decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. We can choose not to be. <laughs> we think. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes, yes. But you are a man and not a God, though you think you are as wise as God. I think these words are addressed not merely to the king of Tyre. I think they're addressed to the human race in the 21st century. Yes. Are you wiser than Daniel? Is no secret hidden from you? By your wisdom and understanding, you've gained wealth for yourself. Mm Mm-hmm and amass gold and silver in your treasuries. By your great skill in trading, you've increased your wealth. Uh, Every one of us in this room is wealthier than kings in the Middle Ages. Every one of us. We all have hundreds of slaves at our bidding. I mean, several of them right now are producing the lights in this room. Several of them are carrying water for us. (laughs) By your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth, and because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And I think right through this book, that sort of is the (laughs) punchline. You think, you think, you think, you think. Therefore, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Because you think you are wise, as wise as a God, I'm going to bring foreigners against you, the most ruthless of nations. They'll draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom, pierce your shining splendor, bring you down to the pit and you will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say I am a God in the presence of those who kill you? You will be but a man. I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. Yes, yes. As I've said several times, there are two steps to enlightenment. Number one, there is a God. Number two, he's not you. (laughs) That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. So he says, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now this next passage has consumed hundreds of gallons of ink (laughs) and many, many trees. Uh, some have said, well, this is really talking about Satan. I don't think so. I think it's talking about, as same as Isaiah 14, it's talking about creaturely pride. And Satan, of course, is an example of creaturely pride, but so are all the rest of us. So he talks about what we were in Eden. We were robed (laughs) in precious jewels. We were anointed as a guardian cherub. We were supposed to be cherubim for God. So I ordained you. 
You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. That's us. That's us. Until wickedness was found in you. Until we said, we know better than you. And when you think about that amazing statement, such a simple, simple statement, and yet so bottomlessly profound, if you do this, You will know how the world is supposed to operate and how it's not supposed to operate for yourselves. I will decide from here on what's good for me and I will decide from here on what's bad for me. And if I decide beating up old ladies is good for me, it's good. And if I decide that giving anybody a place in my life is bad, it's bad. Mel, you were going to say something? I think it is. I think it is. Yes, yes, yes. So that the king of Tyre is representative of all of us. So that this isn't merely, it isn't merely an attack on Tyre and Tyre's king. It's an attack on all of us. Exactly. Yes. 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 No. Yep. 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 Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. Here's beauty again. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you down to the earth and made a spectacle of you before kings. So there's, there's the picture that... The snake whispered, you don't need God. You've got, look how beautiful you are. Look how capable you are. You don't need God. You can decide the principles of reality for yourself. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. This is the fascinating thing to me about what happens when we exalt ourselves. If humanity... is the apex then humanity is nothing there is no meaning in life because we're all going to die the average on death is pretty level one per customer. (laughs) 
If we are the most significant thing in the universe, then there is nothing significant in the universe. This is where European philosophy came in the 20s and the 30s after the First World War. They called it existentialism. And they said the bad joke of existence is there is no meaning but humans have to have meaning. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you do? Well, you make it up. You know, if the meaning of your life is to know the earned run average of every pitcher since 1911, good for you. If the meaning of your life is rebuilding a 1957 Chevy, good for you. If the meaning of your life is pornography, good for you. You're not hurting anybody. Now you see, that was created, as I say, in the 20s and the 30s. It took, as is always the case, about 50 years for it to get on the street. This is what is today called postmodernism. There is no meaning in life. Choose your own meaning. Good luck. That's where we are. Because, because, Nineteenth century Europe said, we're it. A fire has come out of us and is consuming us. Now I might say that Ezekiel was prophesying the twentieth and twenty-first centuries. I don't think so. I think he's talking about humanity in every century. <laughs> when we make ourselves the ultimate, there is no ultimate. It's over. And the, the tragedy of our society today is exactly there. Uh, Dorothy Sayers, who was a British murder mystery writer and playwright and translator of Dante's Inferno, uh, a, a multi-talented woman. She wrote something that I came across recently that uh, was very profound. She said, when you decide that you are the center of reality, you're going to discover that the world is hostile to you. And you're going to be condemned to an increasingly angry personality. That's exactly where we are today. People say, where's all this anger coming from? It's coming from the world's out to get me. Yeah. Yeah. That's bound to make you angry. <laughs> so there it is. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Sidon. I'm against you, O Sidon. I'll gain glory within you. They will know that I am the Lord when I inflict punishment on her and show myself holy within her. Now how is God's holiness going to be shown in Sidon?
All right. All right. Yes. Look down into the promises to Israel that follows. Do you see the same phrase there? Uh huh. Hallowed, holy. So, God's holiness, what are we talking about? We're talking about in the his absolute otherness. There is nothing to compare to the Holy One. Now, you see, for the pagan, the pagan says, well, there are lots of holy ones. They are different. You know, this is a holy place. It's, it's kind of eerie. It's, it's kind of strange. It's, it's it's different from my ordinary experience. So the gods, these spirits that are inhabiting the world, they're, they're holy. The Bible says hogwash. They are not. <laughs> They're not holy. They may be different, but they're not holy. There's only one of whom it can be said, He is holy. You want to talk about unique understandings in the Bible? That's right at the top. There's only one being in the entire cosmos who is truly other. That means then power, greatness, terror. I think the reason horror movies have become popular is because we've lost sight of God. None of us is afraid of walking into church. Wow, God's in here. Yipes. <laughs> we've lost him. We've lost him. God says, as, as someone said, number one, when I, one, fulfill my prediction, and two, bring down what seemed all-powerful, you're going to know that you're dealing with somebody who's not of the same order of being as you. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we rip it off our tongues. 
Every time we say it, hallowed be thy name. What? Holy be your name. Let the world see you as you truly are in my life, in our life, this week. Wow. When I gather the people of Israel from the nations where they have been scattered, I will show myself holy. What's he doing? When he... lifts up what seemed hopelessly lost. <laughs> when I bring down what seemed all powerful You'll know I am the Holy One. And when I bring up the one that seemed hopelessly lost. As I said to you before, part of the reason the Hebrew people did not believe they could go into exile is because you went into exile, you disappeared. And God said, that's not a problem. That's no big deal. Just because it's never happened before. And I've always loved this in Isaiah. I can do a new thing. Because I am not part of the cosmos. The sun can't do a new thing. The moon can't do a new thing. The wind can't do a new thing. The rain can't do a new thing. But I can. Because I'm the Holy One. That idea that there is one being who is absolutely other than this cosmos. That book is the only place that idea has ever originated and taken. Now, people have thought about it. The Egyptians, the Greeks, but it never took. It couldn't. This world is all there is. But these dumb Hebrews, they just said, we don't know. That's just the way it is. <laughs> God grabbed this. And he wouldn't let go of us. <laughs> we tried to make him let go of us. But he wouldn't. He's the one God. He's the Holy One. And the miracle then is, if that's true, there's only one holy character. His. And his character <laughs> is Hesed. And truth. And goodness. And justice and purity. Wow. Wow. And so this crazy guy Peter says, you must be holy as he is holy. What? <laughs> Become absolutely other? <laughs> no, no. His character. Don't be conformed to the lusts of your past. But, picking up Paul's words, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Peter said, gird up the loins of your minds. Again, very interesting to me. You want to be holy? You better think straight. And if you think straight, you realize that your desires were killing you. And if you can somehow be delivered to become master of your desires, you'll live forever. Lord Jesus, thank you. 
Thank you that you came to earth not as the king of Tyre, but as a poor Galilean peasant. And in that form, you showed us what holiness really is about, what deliverance is about. Thank you. Oh God, oh God, help us in this world where we are bombarded with the self-sufficiency of humanity to know that it is not true and to day after day hurl ourselves at your feet. For you are the source of life. You are the source of hope. And we praise you and glorify you. In your name, amen. Amen.